Um, all right, I'm getting this, I got this question twice, so thank you for the, giving me money twice, I appreciate it. I was gonna get to this question anyway. Um, I'm fascinated by religious people's neutral or even negative view of money. Can you please discuss this? I've read Dan Conan's money speech at least a dozen times and it's beautiful. Yes, it is amazingly beautiful. Um, to really understand religious people's negative view of money, um, I mean, partially Dan Conia explains it, but I would also encourage you to uh, read an essay I wrote on usury, on the history of usury. It's in my book, um, The Moral Case of Finance. But also, if you look online, I think there's a free copy of at least a version of it that you can find, or there might be a free copy, I'm not sure, I think it's free. Um, so just put usury you're on, Brooke. We're going to the history of, of money lending, and I show how, to a large extent, people's attitude towards bankers and money was, was uh, determined by certain, you know, uh, certain stuff that was said in the Old Testament. Um, I, I certainly think that it, 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 it had to do, you know, it's, it's not irrelevant that Jesus throws the money changes out of the temple. It's not an accident that, you know, God tells the Jews that charging interest is, is a, a mortal sin, at least charging interest from people who are your brothers um, is a mortal sin. It's not an accident that Dante places money lenders in the, in the seventh rung of hell. I think it's the seventh. And that, um, uh, by the way, with a bag of money around their neck, dragging them towards the fire, pulling them down towards the fire. But essentially, I would say this. Money and seeking money as a, as, a, as a reward for productivity is fundamentally egoistic. It's fundamental. I mean, you're, 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 you're striving towards attaining money in order to satisfy your needs, to satisfy your, your, your material needs, <clears throat> and, and, and in seeking pleasure in life. Um, you, you're going after money because you're going after life. Money is one way to do that, right? Money is an essential way to do that. <coughs> you can't survive without some money. Money is also a measure of success, or success of what? Success of actually, um, success of actually achieving your values. Values for what? Values for, for, for life. Whose life? Your life. So money is a reflection of egoism. It's a reflection to some extent, and this comes out in, in the money speech. It's a reflection of your individual pursuit of your values. So it doesn't surprise me that a philosophy that rejects, that rejects, um, not that rejects, that embraces altruism, embraces the idea you should live for others, embraces the idea that your life is nothing if it's not in service of other people. That's, that sacrifice, self-sacrifice, is the most noblest, noblest thing you can do. It is not a surprise to me that a philosophy like that, a religion like that, would hate money, would reject money, would view money as the root of all evil, or at the very best, view money as, you know, just bland, nothing, amoral. Okay? I mean... Money represents, money represents your time, your energy, your effort in achieving your values. Values that are, that are materially tradable, that are tradable. That's what money reflects. It's the, the, the value of the values you've created. <clears throat> and that's very egoistic. That's very selfish. And, and the Christian morality rejects, rejects all of that. And of course, making money off of money is the most selfish thing you can do. And, uh, and therefore the most evil of all the things you can do. All right, please. To a money maker, as well as to an artist, work is not a painful duty or a necessary evil, but a way of life. To him, productive activity is the essence, the meaning, and the enjoyment of existence. It is the state of being alive. Arthur Dwining Davis had created Alcoa by the extraordinary range of his vision. He was a true builder, and in order to feel alive, he had to remain a builder to his last moment. That long-range vision is characteristic of all the great money makers. It was characteristic of J.P. Morgan, who made his fortune by his ability to judge which industries held the potential of future growth and to finance as well as organize their integration into industrial giants. 
United States Steel is one of his monuments, as well as the monument of Andrew Carnegie, whose company was the central property of that merger and who had started in, in life as a steel worker. The moneymaker's ability to defy established customs, to stand alone against storms of criticism and predictions of failure, was eloquently demonstrated by Henry Ford. Ford was a revolutionary innovator, both in technology and in economics. He was the first man to discover the financial advantages of mass production, the first to use an assembly line, the first to refute the pra in practice the theory of class warfare by offering his workers an unsolicited raise in wages higher than any union scale at the time, which he did not for an altruistic purpose, but for the honorably rational purpose of attracting the ablest kind of labor and obtaining a higher production efficiency. <laughs>